All right, so we have some very important information of great consequence that should not be taken lightly. They're basically telling you what they're going to do next, okay? This is breaking news. The State Department has advised Americans to immediately leave Belarus to get out of the country while you still can because there is a very good chance that the borders with adjacent countries like Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland are going to be shut down entirely. This is huge. It's very easy to brush a travel advisory like this off in the current geopolitical climate of very, very slow and incremental building of tensions, but it shouldn't be. In light of everything else that's been transpiring along this border, this is serious. This means that they know that the borders are about to be closed. Now, what happens once the borders between Belarus and Latvia and Lithuania and Poland, which are already contracted down to a couple of corridors for each one of those countries, what happens when they close them down entirely? Well, this is going to drastically restrict Russia's flow of goods, and it is going to be somewhat of an embargo through the Sawalki corridor, okay, which transits into Russia's exclave of Kaliningrad. Now, up until this point, there has been military buildups along this border. You've had Wagner forces. So this is the Polish border for anybody who just got to this channel in the last day or so. I'm sure if you've watched this channel for a while, you know Eastern uh, geography quite well now. But there's this place called the Sawalki Corridor, okay? And it's home to, or it transits into the Kaliningrad exclave, which is home to Russia's nuclear arsenal, or some of it, as well as a port to its uh, Baltic Sea warship fleet and submarine fleet. And it's very strategic, and it's something that they will never let go. But there's been this systematic shutting down of the borders, okay? And this is going to be of great consequence. This is when the war starts to get crazy. Is it going to happen immediately? No, but understand that this is another major escalation. The State Department is signaling that tensions between Belarus and the surrounding countries are rising. Of course, we now have tactical nuclear weapons deployed in Belarus and Lukashenko reiterated a warning today that Belarus will use nuclear weapons if attacked. Now, on the same day, you have the State Department issuing a travel advisory that people need to get out because you're not going to be able to get out when the borders do close. That they're going to close the borders, that level of embargo is effectively an act of war. Okay, and this uh, makes things in that region all the more tense. It means that there's a much greater likelihood that there's going to be some sort of cross-border exchange here, especially now that you, you continuously have these migrants. Some of them are being uh, claimed to be uh, sleeper cells or agents uh, that are put up by the Belarusians and the Russian government to sneak into the Baltic states. Whether that's the case or not, we don't know. But this is very significant, okay? So the Lithuanian government on August 18th closed two border crossings with Belarus. The Polish, Lithuanian, and Latvian governments have stated that further closures of border crossings with Belarus are possible, meaning likely, I would say, in light of what has happened thus far. Far. We've seen fences erected, we've seen anti-tank barriers, mining in certain places on the Belarusian side, of course, military buildups on both sides of the border. It does not take a rocket scientist like the great Green Gregs to figure out what's about to happen here. The same thing happened in Ukraine, it's just happening in Belarus. Now, what the timeline is going to be for the unfolding of events is unknown. It could be a few weeks, it could be a few years before a war really breaks out in this region. But the way that things are rapidly escalating, and now with the news <clears throat> that F-16s are going to be delivered, and remember, the F-16s are viewed by the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov as being a nuclear-capable delivery system. So they are going to view it as a potential nuclear threat. So regardless of what the conventional capabilities are of these F-16s, which 
We're going to talk about there's some information provided today that those planes, just like I've been saying all along, are going to get there much sooner than people expect. In spite of all the himming and hawing about, oh, we don't have the pilots, never mind that. Those planes are, they're probably already some of them there. And the SBU person who just can't keep their mouth shut uh, it corroborates that, that, uh, that claim, okay? So I also got a message from a fairly venerable source today that's provided me info before on what's going on in Poland. Apparently the Polish parliament has enacted a few days ago a law that's going to allow the building of private standalone bunkers for personal use of a surface up to 400 square feet without the need to obtain a construction permit. Now ask yourself why oh why with the Polish military buildup, the rapid, we're talking about rapid, they just bought another 96 Apache helicopters today. They are building up their army, they're buying HIMARS, they're buying tanks, they're buying planes. They're probably going to get nuclear weapons at some point. I mean, if you have the delivery system, you essentially have the nuclear weapons. Anyways, why on the earth would the Polish government suddenly be more lax in their restrictions about people building standalone bunkers? Well, it's because they're going into a great amount of debt in order to become this military superpower that they want to be. You've seen the military parade last week. And they're trying to offload some of this civil defense spending into private hands. And you do that by making it easier for people. They're trying to encourage the population to take matters into their own hands and get prepared for war. The writing is on the wall with respect to what's going to happen. Now, this delivery of F-16, 61, of course they pick... You notice how they pick the countries that you just never thought were going to give them F F F-16s? Uh, we're talking about Denmark and uh, what's the other country that is going to be doing? Uh, the Netherlands. So they, they're trying to spread it out. And, and this is why they don't want to have one country draw the complete ire of the Russian military. So Germany gives something. Russians get mad at Germany for a bit, then France decides to send some medium-range missiles, then Italy sends something, and you have all these countries that they probably have a timeline for how they're going to release this, because you don't want any one country being individually as standoff. You want to, to communicate that we're a unified alliance and that uh, each one of us is contributing on a, a timeline, a rollout, of military hardware. So you're getting 61 planes confirmed from the Netherlands and Denmark. 61 delivery platforms for nuclear weapons. Now, on the same day that all of this stuff is building up, Lavrov comes out again and he says the following. He basically reiterates his threats. Now, when Lavrov makes a threat about, when he says the words nuclear, it's not like Monday Medvedev, where he's just this intractable character who, you know, they have to rein in constantly. And his words just end up, people get desensitized to his threats. When Lavrov talks about the threat of nuclear war, you have to take him seriously. This is the Russian foreign minister, okay? And this guy is very intelligent and should not be underestimated. When he came out two months ago and said... F-16s are a delivery platform for tactical nuclear weapons. He meant it. And now, on the same day that it's mostly been confirmed that Ukraine is going to be getting these things much sooner. I mean, we've, I've been saying this for over a year, that they're going to get the F-16s. They're going to get the long range. They're probably going to get nukes. At this rate, they're probably going to get nukes, okay? So he went on to slam NATO for provoking a nuclear conflict by supporting Kiev, a great danger in the context of the Ukrainian conflict is linked with the fact that the United States and NATO countries, the Russian diplomat continued, while gearing up for confrontation, run the risk of becoming involved in a direct arm clash between nuclear powers. We think that this course of events can and must be prevented. Washington and its Western allies have determined potential peace talks between Kiev and Moscow. NATO countries have transferred tens of billions of dollars in weapons to Kiev and trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops. So sorry, that I said determine, I said under, I meant say undermine. 
So they've undermined potential peace talks. So the prospect of peace is pretty much, it's nil at this point. Now, the reason why this is so important is Russia is starting to become stretched in terms of their commercial aviation sector, in terms of uh, these attacks are starting to take its toll on the Russian economy. Strategically, the goal of NATO is to defeat Russia. So these attacks on the Russian nuclear triad are going to start to add up. And Russia does not want to be reactive. They don't want to be provoked into utilizing a nuclear weapon. Because understand that there are forces within NATO, be they special operations, possibly in Ukraine, who are actively trying to provoke the Russians into utilizing nuclear weapons in the hope that they use them and then that would give the NATO a license to respond and intervene. I received a comment on one of my videos yesterday and it was very concerning to me because if this is the thinking amongst people, then we're in a lot of trouble because people need to realize that they're not as smart as you think. They are greedy, they are rapaciously greedy, but they're not that smart, okay? And here's what the comment was. And no offense to this viewer, this was a very respectful uh, comment that they left on the channel. These are the kind of comments I love because they get me thinking, even though I've heard this line of thinking many times before and it's fantasy land. Hey Nate, at this point, I think this is all a big game and that all these countries are involved in. Sure, I mean, just think about that for a second. What is What would that actually entail? You're talking about Russia, China, shadowy figures smoking cigars, in some room somewhere, speaking in different languages, colluding on levels that, I mean, people can't even stay married. Two people can't even stay married in the best of conditions. You seriously think that the elites of all the countries of the world are plotting this just to sell weapons and stuff? No, no, no. I, I understand that people would like to entertain that thought because it's comforting to believe that our leaders are not actually this dumb to bring us this close to the brink but I regret to inform you that it is far, far worse than you think, okay? There's absolutely no way Russia has not responded by now. He's, he's talking about all the attacks on the Russian nuclear facilities in that video I was talking about yesterday. Week after week, we see these incidents, attacks on nuclear facilities. I'm convinced it's all a big game, and it looks like I cut off the comment, but it was pretty much, uh, that was pretty much the end of the comment. You know, it's all a big game, it's all a big conspiracy, 406 thumbs up which is concerning for me because that means that this is a this is a view and this is indicative of people who are becoming exhausted with this issue and they just presume that because it's such a mission creep incremental march towards the worst possible outcome that that means that it must not be real that just because the russians haven't used a nuke yet that means they won't here is my response. It's a convenient and comforting thought to believe that our leaders are smart enough to put aside their myriad differences and collude against us for some common goal. The truth is they are barely smart enough to prevent nuclear war and that's running out. Russia has responded to all of these attacks by ramping up their air assaults. They know certain NATO adjacent elements want them to do this to possibly compel them to use a nuclear weapon. Remember what Lindsey Graham and Blumenthal said, if you use a nuke in Ukraine and the radiation gets blown on the wind in our direction, that will be grounds for us to invoke Article 4 and 5, then NATO enters the war. Russia doesn't want that. They're willing to potentially use nuclear weapons as I'm going to talk about, but they want to do it on their own terms. They don't want to do it in a planned and strategic way as opposed to being provoked and just reacting. Some elements of NATO might think that Russia using a nuke will be justify, justification to accelerate NATO's involvement in the war. Russia will use nukes, but they would prefer to do so on their own terms and not be provoked into use. Both sides might think they can actually win a nuclear war, and that's the scary part. Here's the thing, guys. <sighs> Understand the power of greed. These people are so incredibly rapacious that do not put it past them to gamble. We're talking about people who gamble in the stock market. Think about the power 
of imperialistic greed and just the lengths that people are willing to go to, especially when they don't have to be the ones making the sacrifice. Understand that they will, they will push the boundaries and skirt the line of nuclear failure if it means a big payoff in the form of Russia's trillions of dollars of resource wealth. And vice versa, you could say. Russia stands to gain a lot. Now, the imperialist Pax American NATO Western Golden Billion agenda indeed has much to gain monetarily from having Russia as, under their control, not only as a way to combat the Chinese, but just having a, a pipeline, literally, of Russian resources, endless amounts of resources to make them insurmountably wealthy. The allure of that, okay, will override any discretion when it comes to the use of nuclear weapons. So no, they are not all sitting in a room, they just haven't pushed the button yet. This is more of a testament to the patience and resolve of the Russian government and military than anything, okay? This is the Russians knowing that once you put that, you take that genie out of the ball, you can't put it back. They know that if they use a nuke, they need to be measured in how and where they use it and under what conditions they do so. But there is an argument which is getting more and more media attention. I first talked about this story months ago. The media is referencing Sergei Karaganov's uh, articles more and more. He's a prominent political scientist and foreign policy expert who's advised both Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. He, this is the strategy that he proposes, okay? He is trying to advise Putin that we will have to make nuclear deterrence a convincing argument again by lowering the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons that's been set unacceptably high and by rapidly but prudently moving up the deterrence escalation ladder. The enemy must know that we are ready to deliver a preemptive strike in retaliation for all of its current and past acts of aggression in order to prevent a slide into global nuclear war. This is the definition of escalate to de-escalate. You use a nuclear weapon with the hopes that the other side sees the writing on the wall and says, okay, this is madness. We need to stop before this spirals out of control. Otherwise, you get to a point where the window to use something, the strategy like that, is not going to be there anymore. And it's just going to quickly escalate to global thermonuclear war. So when these F-16s get delivered, and why the Belarusians are, or the State Department is asking American citizens to vacate that country with the threats of Lukashenko today that they will use tactical nuclear weapons to defend themselves. When all these things coalesce at once towards the end of the year, this is when the, the uh, strategic use of a limited tactical nuclear weapon in some domain, some space of the battlefield, possibly not even in the battlefield. It could be a demonstrative, uh, and I would, it, this would be more in line with Russia's more measured and uh, patient strategy thus far, would be for them to restart nuclear testing, possibly on Novaya Zemlya. That's why Sergei Shoigu, some people say that's why he went there. A few weeks ago, uh, there was some training up there in the Arctic. That's way up here in the Arctic where they've been, where they've done hundreds of nuclear detonations. It's a good place for it because, you know, even if the wind blows, it's not, not many people are affected. Um, I'm not saying it's a great place. Like, yeah, you know, it's great nuclear detonations. But this is something I could see the Russians do. Unfortunately, I don't think at this point, I think that will, their bluff will be called once again. And it will just give NATO more confidence in sending even more, more devastating weapons, thus escalating the conflict, mission creeping in, because every type of these weapon systems they send in there, they have to send in a whole additional army of uh, maintenance workers, likely special operations, and for all we know, there's going to be retired pilots 
or people from NATO nations, mercenaries who are going to be flying these actual planes. Now, the F-16s in themselves, people have said this on numerous occasions, the Russians have one of the most formidable uh, air defense systems in the world. It's a multi-layered defense system from S-200s to S-500s. So the idea that the F-16s are just like the super weapon, no, but it is that prospect that these will be used uh, or that these could be used more readily to deploy NATO's tactical nuclear weapons. Now you could say that any plane could be modified to do so, but you know we've seen that just because you, you think something should be possible because of the supply chain bottlenecks and just the pace of things, we're not in a World War II mass military economy mobilization mode yet although that is coming and there you know as much as people like to uh, say that the ukrainians are finished and they're done for the actions of the russian government right now are signaling that they too are preparing either for a major offensive or that they're they're certainly not done in their mobilization efforts there are rumors that they're about to mobilize another 250,000 to 500,000 possibly covertly so not to spook the population but the daily attacks on moscow that are ongoing they had to close one of their airports a uh, couple of their airports in around the moscow airspace recently so these are becoming more problematic the commercial aviation sector is struggling to get the parts that they need to fly people around eventually this economic pressure is going to affect the Russian economy, the Russian psyche, and Russia is going to have to make a move at some point now that these F-16s have arrived. And Zelensky has basically said that we will not concede any of our territory. In fact, he cheekily said that we'll give up Belgorod, which of course is already a part of Russia. So we'll give you the part of the country that we've been, that we've had partisans and insurgents in for the last few months. Okay, you know that NIZ supporting guy who uh, apparently the media is fine with him being an NIZ supporting guy. So yeah, things are just not looking good at all, folks. It is not looking good at all. Ukraine Zelensky says F-16s make him confident that Russia will lose the war. This is, you know, I understand that they're just banking on people's ignorance here. But Russia losing the war is a non-starter. It's not going to happen. They will not let it happen without the use of nuclear weapons. It seems like I'm just repeating myself over and over again in saying that, but you have to because that's a mainstream headline right there. I mean, people actually believe that. People actually believe that the Russians are going to let Ukraine take back the territory without using nuclear weapons and it escalating to a thermonuclear conflict. So the Russians, really their only possible way out of this is to detonate a nuke somewhere to spook everyone, to scare the shit out of NATO, showing them that, hey, we actually mean business and we're willing to push the button. And that's the other problem, is that if you're so greedy, as our leaders likely are, I mean, when you get into the, you know, you're making billions and you're making millions, understand that a million just doesn't cut it after you've made a billion. I mean, a million is like chump change after you've made a billion, I could imagine, okay? It's all relative, right? So understand that they're, if, if they have to lose a few cities, if they have to, uh, you know, if they think they can get away without too much collateral damage, you don't think they'll try to decapitate Moscow and the Kremlin? You don't think they have an intelligence apparatus that is so deep inside of Russia and inside our countries as well that are just ready between the, the cyber warfare component of things, the biological warfare component, the uh, EMP weapons, the tactical nukes, you know, the submarine, I mean, there's so many dimensions of the space of strategic warfare, but if they had the chance, don't think that they wouldn't sacrifice 50, 100 million people in order to get what Russia has. If they can wipe 
Putin and Moscow off the map, if they think they can do it while sustaining a minimal amount of damage, of course there's going to be damage. When Russia unleashes its nuclear weapons, if they can get them off the ground, that is, okay? So this is where the other issue comes in. We don't know if there's spies there who are working in the Russian government who might try to sabotage Russia's attempts to fire missiles back. We don't know how things function on that James Bond level of stuff. But I'm sure there's a spy game going on there, back and forth, constantly, nonstop, trying to keep ahead of the other side. A war that we don't even see, that's probably always ongoing. That's always happening. And uh, I, I can just infer that that's what must be happening. And I could see the Russians also believe, because, I mean, they have a massive country. They are very dug in. Their, some of their bunkers could withstand direct hits from the biggest nukes that the U.S. government could throw out. I think our biggest nuclear weapon is one megaton or something like that. The Russians have uh, nukes that are far larger than that. So, you know, it's really, and it really comes down to, if you want to talk about who the ultimate victor would be, it comes down to who has the most amount of nukes left. That's who's ultimately going to win. Now, what are they going to win? In a wa irradiated wasteland? Sure, I don't think either side wants it to come to that. But understand, these greedy people, if they think that they can retain power and that there's a chance that they can get this trillions of dollars of resource wealth and position them to go to the war with the Chinese eventually, even though the Chinese will likely be sucked in, don't you think they would roll the dice and possibly do it if they felt there was a window of opportunity and maybe only a few of our cities would get nuked. They would probably do it, and that's the scary part, okay? The fact that they're doing this in the first place, there is no, you could maybe make the argument that within an independent nation, there is some deep state that is operating, and even that is a stretch. I know a lot of people like to believe that, but to think that that's a multinational thing, it's never going to happen. Again, 50% of marriages end in divorce, a lifelong commitment. You seriously think that, I mean, the only way that happens is if there's some other interdimensional shape-shifting reptiles that they're all at the behest of, like the, uh, the Bogdanov meme. Go look, watch Bogdanov memes and the, uh, the Bogdanov twins, they run this whole show. But uh, on a more serious note, no, that's not what's happening. The fact is, I know a lot of you like to take comfort in this idea, but unfortunately, it's a scary thought. It's a scary thought to believe that we're alone on this rock and there is no secret cabal who has the answers to what's going on. No, everybody is flying by the seat of their pants. Sure, a lot of people have a bit more power and intelligence uh, as to what's going on. According to Sarah Ashton Cerilio, the SBU spokesperson training of Ukrainian F-16 pilots began 70 to 90 days ago. Now, why would you say this now? You know, loose lips sink ships, as they say. So either she, he, she is saying this uh, because they are trying to uh, mask the fact that they're losing the war and the offensive is going horribly uh, as definitely not going to plan and they're saying that the first deliveries of F-16 fighter jets will take place in 2023 or this is just something they've tried to hide for the longest time and now they're trying to gloat about haha we tricked you the planes are actually coming well if I could figure out that they were going to get those planes as soon as they started talking about it last year or actually not last year, because last year Biden said that if we sent the planes, that would be World War III and the tanks, and now we're sending the planes and the tanks. Oh yeah, he said only if there was Americans in those planes, which there probably might, maybe, possibly be. Um, anyways, neither here nor there. They're getting the planes, and it's going to elevate this conflict to the next level. And that is never good, all right? So... What else do we need to talk about today? Uh, the fires are raging. This fire is actually in the Volgograd region. It's a port facility, I do believe. So the attacks continue 
deep inside Russia. This is a video of the Panama Canal right now. As a result of the drought, there are hundreds of ships that are waiting to pass through the canal two or three times what is normal. And I'll show you the marine traffic. So you can go to marinetraffic.com and you can see all these ships. So that image I just showed you, you can get an aerial view of what's going on. Look at all these ships. These are massive oil tankers, cargo vessels, huge ships. Billions of dollars pass through here. And they're saying that this could potentially cause prices to increase significantly if this region doesn't get more water. A huge backlog of 200 ships are stuck trying to enter Panama Canal as they wait weeks amid slow traffic due to drought. Delays set to wipe $200 million of profits and cause a spike in U.S. grocery and parcel prices. So it costs a lot of money to have these vessels just sitting there for weeks and weeks on end. And it's going to create a huge problem, especially in light of what is going on in California, where of course there was a run on the stores, major flooding throughout uh, the southern part of the state. And of course, these fires that we're witnessing up here that are only going to get worse. This is from the uh, Hotspot account, uh, Hotshot Wake Up account on Twitter. And uh, somebody sent him this video. And this is a fire NATO, or they think it's possibly just a, a water spout or a normal tornado, but caused by the heat, the high pressure and the low pressure mixing together. So these fires are just raging. And the big problem that they're not quite talking about yet because they don't want to spook people, but I'm going to tell you right now, as I've been saying for the longest time, have a plan today to get out. If you live anywhere in a, what are they calling it? What do they call it again? There's a term for it. There's a term for it. It's called a uh, wildland urban interface. If you live in a city that's surrounded by trees, don't wait and blow up my inbox saying, I need to get something shipped here immediately because the forest is burning down. People are doing that. And as much as my heart goes out to you that you're struggling right now, we've been warning you for a long time. You got to do this shit beforehand. Because if you try to do it at the same time as everybody else is trying to do it, and the fact is there ain't no postal service or couriers going into these regions right now. In fact, a lot of these regions have simply been closed off. You can't even travel there. Mail's not getting, no supply trucks, nothing. So you got to do it in advance. And I'm telling you that in the coming week, it is going to, we're going to see record temperatures. There's a massive heat dome about to descend over the most vulnerable part of the country as it pertains to forest fires. This is this weekend. This entire region is in a level five state of drought. Northwest territories where these fires are raging, these are all above average temperatures. This place is going to burn down. A lot of people are referencing this map where they show uh, all the fires at once and they're saying, oh, the government's trying to fool us. <sighs> I'm losing my patience sometimes, man. I'm just, I, I, there's so much fucking stupidity nowadays. Um, so this is the situation. There's fires burning everywhere. Okay, and it's just what it is. Now, obviously, these dots are not to scale, but you can see the smoke. You can see the smoke all over the place. So please, have a plan. Yes, we all hate the government. We hate the photo ops with the prime minister going there trying to milk this and push the whole climate agenda and blah, blah, blah. The fact is, this shit is happening. Fires don't burn unless the conditions are right, whether it's arson or negligence, which a lot of fires in the woodlands are caused by human negligence and even arson. They're easy to put out if there's not in record drought-like and hot conditions. So uh, it is what it is. I, I'm almost ready to give up, man, to be honest. I just, I just don't know anymore. I just think we're, we're doomed as a species, like... We're doomed. Sorry. Oh, did I say that out loud? Yeah. Uh, this is interesting. I can't get over this graph. I mean, look at this. 3.8% of the U.S. GDP is for interest payments, federal government interest payments. One trillion dollars. 
And that's just in the last year. Last year it was 600 billion. What are we gonna do? Well, if you're watching the channel, you're ahead of the curve, folks. You are ahead of the curve. You gotta buy some of this. You see this stuff right here? This is a finite resource, that's gold. Gold is used for space. This is gold foil that the Russians and their unsuccessful lunar landing, unfortunately, but hey, at least they tried. And you know, there's a lot of people throwing shade on the Russians because they couldn't land a module on the south side of the moon or something like that. But the fact is the south side, it doesn't moon have a south, anyways, the pole of the moon, I, I don't know, along its act, anyways. Uh, understand that they made an attempt and they'll probably get it right next time. But to me, gold is just, it's such a mysterious substance, you know? Gold is used in, it's used in the most archaic forms of human innovation, like monetary means as a means of currency 10,000 years ago. And now it's at the forefront of space exploration, of chip manufacturing. Isn't that weird? that this rare substance is what we are using to ultimately traverse and explore the cosmos, to explore the metaverse. And uh, it was also one of the most archaic forms of monetary exchange. It's just, it's fascinating, which is why you should buy it because they are artificially suppressing the price because they know Shizzy's gonna hit the fizzy. And uh, not only is less gold being mined, more is being used in products. And for that reason, it is likely only going to increase in price. I wanted to briefly talk about this. You're giving us a bad name. And, uh, you know, they're calling them doomsday preppers. What were they really? Two Brit doomsday preppers plan to build nuclear dirty bomb. Austrian police arrest pair and third accomplice after finding massive weapons arsenal. Now this is in Britain, where to have this, oh no, this is, uh, is this in Austria? A pair of British doomsday preppers who Austrian police claim to have planned to build a nuclear dirty bomb were found with a massive arsenal of weapons at their home. The pair who had not been named in local media faced up to five years in jail after being charged, that's it? You get five years if you don't have your permit taking your restricted firearm to the gun range here. Five years? Detectives say they found materials for making bombs, including explosive TNT, but you see what they're trying to do here. They got to demonize the people who are preparing for the shizzy hit the fizzy. Look, the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world are doomsday preppers. Joe Biden is a doomsday prepper. He's the biggest doomsday prepper out there. The US government are the biggest preppers. Go and watch our series, which is getting no love from the YouTube algorithm, which makes no sense whatsoever because all of these videos have a great watch time. That's one of the key metrics to determine if some of these videos are sent out abroad. Now, I'm not gonna complain and I'm not gonna be one of these people that says, oh, YouTube doesn't like me and blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you that the algorithm has screwed up with these videos because people enjoy them and I'm not saying that they're 100% accurate. It's a series of videos that we did where we rate various notable figures on their apocalypse survivability. Joe Biden has got the best score so far. Now I know what you're saying. Joe Biden can barely walk up a flight of stairs and he's probably not gonna live long after the bombs drop. He's probably gonna die of natural causes. Maybe, maybe, but he has the best chance out of anybody from surviving the apocalypse. Why? because he's gonna be the first guy that knows what's coming. He's gonna have the intelligence, he's gonna have the briefings to let him know that, hey, the bombs are coming, we gotta take you off in this billion dollar airplane to this multi-billion dollar underground complex that nobody knows exists but us that has enough provisions to help you survive for however long you're gonna survive, which may not be long. Regardless, 90, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to uh, ruin it for you. Go and watch it, but go watch all of them. We're making a whole series of these. And again, they're just not being, you know, noticed by the algorithm yet, which is why I need you guys to just go and watch them and maybe leave a comment. That's the best thing you can do for this channel is help us out in the shorts department. They're pushing our shorts 
that honestly are not even that representative of this channel. Some of the outdoor stuff that we used to do, you know, that's the stuff that they're trying to push. But unfortunately, people who watch those videos, they'll sub for that content. And because we're mostly focused on daily updates and everything falling apart all around us, well, they don't get the same kind of content and then they bounce. So I would hope that people would start watching these videos, which we put a lot of work into, and I'm sure you're gonna enjoy them. Let us know in the comment section if there's somebody that you would like us to assess. And this is not something we just pull out of our butts. We sit down as a collective and we try to determine on the basis of numerous dimensions. So it's a methodical approach um, that tries to determine what the potential survivability, things like strategic location, uh, a person's temperament, their motivation level, their fitness level, the amount of resources, their commitment to specific preparedness related things and numerous other dimensions are taken into account to as best as we can give you a quantitative uh, assessment. Um, I was going to say uh, an estimate of what their survivability is. Anyways, go check it out. I'll post a link in the description below. In terms of the war, the Ukrainians are still stalled in Robotine on the southern front. They keep saying we're making some gains in and around here in the Bakhmut region. And uh, the Russians are also stating the same. The Russians are planning on mobilizing a bunch of troops and going on the offensive next spring. So they say, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? In terms of what's going on in the Persian Gulf, uh, that situation is getting really spicy. Iran threatened to open fire on a U.S. warship yesterday. It's only a matter of time. Briefly spoke about that. We also need to talk about right now, we still got this spy plane here. And as you can see, it made it very, very close. It's getting way too close to comfort for Sochi, which is right here. Now, when they do these runs, typically within the next 24 hours, there's an attack on the Kerch Bridge. There's an attempt of Ukrainian drones or missile system or uh, medium range, short range, I guess it would be medium range missiles that they have now, the uh, Sculpt missiles and the uh, Storm Shadow missiles, attacks on various Russian infrastructure warships within this region. So we can almost bet that eventually Russians are gonna have to shoot this down. Again, they've already taken one down last year, I believe. They're gonna do it again because that's just the nature of what is about to happen. I think that's about all we got to talk about. And the North Koreans sent out another ominous threat today about the prospect of thermonuclear war as a result of the exercises that just kicked off. So let's see what happens, guys. And one final note for all of you who stuck around. We're having a special at the store on right now. We don't do super chats. I don't want to take donations. I'm not throwing shade on people who do. It's just not a model that we've used to sustain this channel. I want you to get something for your support of the channel. If you spend 300 bucks at Canadian Preparedness, you get yourself a 15,000 set of seeds, 36 different seed varieties. If you don't use it this year, you store this in a cold, dry place. You make your own Svalbard seed vault in your basement. The Svalbard Seed Vault is a place in Norway, a doomsday seed vault, and they call me crazy for being the Canadian prepper. Meanwhile, they're stockpiling right in front of us all of the world's seeds in a place far away in the nether regions of the Arctic, and they call us crazy. Make your own seed vault. You're gonna get one of these. This is like a $40, $50 value at least. Okay, we sell it at a fairly low price. So you're getting a good deal. And the reason why we're getting rid of these is because we're gonna be getting a new batch in for next year. You can still, we could still just sell these next year because seeds don't really have a expiration date, especially if you store them properly. But we wanna make sure that we're getting people the freshest uh, varieties available. So you can get one of those, put it away for next year. Or if you live in a region where you can grow all around, try to grow some stuff but definitely good to have do not rely on it you got to get out there you got to garden we've done plenty of videos with our resident gardening expert the soulless soil scientist gardening in canada go and check out her channel 
but get you some seeds. Spend 300 bucks at Canadian Preparedness and you're gonna get yourself 15,000 doomsday seeds, baby. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care.